It's amusing after your morning coffee or tea to start tapping on the cup with your spoon. It's pretty much the same pitch everywhere. Tan, 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 whatever it is. And uh, maybe it's the characteristic pitch of this cup. And if you take another cup, um, another spoon for that matter, maybe you get a different sound. Who knows? So maybe it's always the same pitch from this particular cup if tapped by this spoon. But then I started tapping somewhere else. Those four points emit a common pitch, and those four points also emit a common pitch, but a higher pitch than those four points. We'll explore what's causing this, but you might first think that it has to do with the handle. That seems to be a very suspicious culprit. And thank you very much for pointing that out. Of course it has to do with the handle. But if it has to do with the handle, wouldn't you have thought that this half closer to the handle and this half farther from the handle should behave differently? But that's not how the symmetry is broken. Indeed, the point next to the handle and the point farthest from the handle behave exactly the same way, whereas 45 degrees off you get the higher pitch. It has to do with the handle, perhaps, but the symmetry breaking pattern is not so naive as we at the first thought. Let's understand what's happening, and in order to do this, we'll break it up in two stages. First, we'll understand why any quadruplet of four points that form the vertices of a square always give you the same pitch, a common pitch. And then we'll understand why this quadruplet emits a higher pitch than those four points. Okay, so let's forget about the handle. So the handle, pretend that the handle is not there. When we tap this point, we are making this point vibrate. We are setting it in motion like this. Well, roughly speaking, the point diametrically opposite can react in one of the two ways. When this point is doing that, the other point can go like this or go like this. We say in phase or out of phase. Now, this reaction, this response, is essentially moving the cup back and forth, back and forth, sliding it as a total rigid body, as a whole body. And it does not really, to a good approximation, deform the cup. But of course, the sound has to do with the deformation of the cup, how it's vibrating altogether and so on. So this is not producing sound. That's not what you're hearing. What you're hearing is this response. When this point moves back and forth, this goes in and out. Um, at the same time like this. Professor, why does that make a sound, by the way? Because sound means that some body, for example, it can be your throat, it can be, for example, a bird chirping, it can be cup chiming, is vibrating very, very fast and shaking air around it. And when you shake the air like this, the air next to it gets compressed and bounces off because air has some elasticity. And then that bounce compresses the next part of the air and bounces off. And there is a wave that propagates like this towards the camera and eventually reaches the ear and inside the eardrum this wave is shaking the eardrum and that's what you hear as a sound. Okay. okay, so the vibration and the deformation ultimately of the very rapid deformation of the cup is producing the sound. And this response is not really deforming the cup, whereas this one is. So um, this is what's um, is primarily responsible for the sound. On the other hand, the cup as a whole doesn't want to change its volume if it can help it. It wants to stay as incompressible as possible. In other words, when those two go in, well, by reaction, these two are pushed out in order to keep the same volume. And if these go out, these two are pulled in so that you get this kind of rhombus type um, oscillation. Boom, 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 boom. And that's why any quadruplet of four points that form the vertices of a square are always singing in unison. It doesn't matter which of the four points you start uh, exciting, all the other three follow and four together go into this lozenge or rhombus vibration. Well, so we now understand why this quadruple point and this quadruple point each um, emits a common pitch. Now, why this quadruple point a higher pitch than this quadruple point a lower pitch? In order to understand that, we must resurrect the handle that we have been neglecting so far. So the handle comes back. You see, when Let's say that we excite one of the four points, those, those four points. 
as we saw, it doesn't matter which of the four points you excite because all of them work in unison. But when those four points are vibrating together, they have to take the handle, drag the handle with them because you see one of the points, vibrating points, is attached to the handle. So the handle must move back and forth while those four points um, are vibrating. In contrast, when those four points are made to vibrate, you remember what happens when this goes in, this goes out, and this goes in, this goes out. The point just in between is what we call a node. In other words, to a good approximation, it's stationary. It doesn't move in between. So as far as these quadruple points are concerned, the handle is invisible. It's as if the handle were not there because it's attached to the point that's not doing any vibration, vib vibrational motion. So we now have two elastic systems. You can think of them as springs, if you like. This one and this one. One of them is attached to some heavy mass that it has to drag along. The other one is not attached to anything because this is invisible to those four points and they are made of the same stiff material that is the cup. So imagine two springs. One of them is attached to the heavy mass and the other one is not attached to the heavy mass. And when you let them go, what do you hear? The heavy one goes whoom, whoom, whoom in a very sluggish way, whereas the light one goes hee-ho, hee-ho, and that's the difference of the pitch that we hear. And that is why these four points emit a low pitch, whereas those four points emit the higher pitch. So far, we saw where the handle was, and we tried to figure out what the sound um, pattern was like. The inverse problem is also interesting, by which I mean, since we're talking about the pitch of um, the sound that we hear, let's imagine ourselves in a pitch dark room. Say that we walk into this room, we don't know where the handle is, but imagine that we are allowed to go around the cup, tapping it everywhere, and record the sound pattern that we get from each point. From that recorded data of the sound pattern, can we reconstruct where the handle was? That is the inverse problem. Um, a bit more abstractly speaking, instead of saying that we know the cause, and then by solving whatever mathematical model, partial differential equations, what, what not, you try to predict what the effect is going to be, we are going the other direction. We have this observed data, effects if you like, which we know to be true, I mean we, we just see this, and we try to figure out what on earth is causing, is responsible for the production of this effect. So this is the inverse problem rather than forward problem. And if you think about it, much of the scientific endeavor is really about solving an inverse problem. We want to get to the bottom of things, we want to recover the cause. And this very, very simple everyday morning breakfast example shows that the inverse problem is not always naively solvable. Indeed, you probably agree with me that if I took a cup and rotated it by 90 degrees, the basic pattern that we hear, you know, north, south, east, west, and so on, and in between, will be the same. We don't know where the handle is up to 90 degree rotation. You know, so, it can be so here, or here, or here, or here. So we can narrow it down to four possible positions. Yes. Uh, well, okay. So uh, there is some sort of ambiguity, um, you know, as, as regards the position, because the handle can be here, or here, or here, or here, and you would get the same pattern of the noise. But there is something even worse. You can't even tell the number of handles, because instead of having a large handle here, you could have two, maybe medium handles. And you agree that the pattern of the vibration will be the same, or indeed four small handles here, and here, and here, and you would probably get still the same, what we call the ground state, or the same same kind of vibrational pattern. So you can't even tell the number of handles and you can't tell the position of handles. But up to symmetry, you can actually start saying something, and this is a very typical solution, uh, typical situation, you want to mod out. You have, to, you have to sort of neglect and somehow take out the symmetry and then start solving the problem. Anyway, so this very simple example shows that the inverse problem is all not, all, not always solvable, but you can actually say something when you sort of start um, handling the symmetry in a clever way. If we turn the lights out and yeah. you and yeah. I was trying to figure out the cup, yeah. can I do it? We in general can't, but we can say something up to symmetry. You know, we know that, for example, there aren't three handles because that would break the symmetry in a completely different manner. In fact, ever since I noticed this phenomenon, I've been looking for a cup with three handles because that would be very interesting. And recently, a friend of mine, Brian White of Stanford, uh, got me two cups and one of them has three handles. Oh. Now, I'm, unfortunately, it's not a very nice cup. In a, in, I mean, it is a be very beautiful cup, but for our, purposes, for our purposes, it's not a very well-performing cup because it doesn't really chime nicely. Uh, 
and in between so it's somewhat interesting I mean those three points and those three points in between emit a common pitch but in between I'm not sure that I can do this. It's, uh, you can't really hear the difference. It's a very, very small difference. Yeah, so in between there's a slight rising of the pitch that um, I'd like to hear more clearly. So we need a larger cup. By the way, um, this is a very chubby, chunky mug from Stanford Math Department. But if you take a really well-made, thin and delicate china cup, um, this chime is so much more beautiful, so I recommend it. Three. Well, it's three to the three to the three. You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so here we go. Three, four arrows. One more arrow. Well, what does this mean? Three, three arrows of three, three arrows.